kind of justice to, to get people in the same room so that people can really develop an analysis and look for alternatives where people, communities are not just being played off against each other. So for me, that was the first time I was in a room with people from all these different bodies, which I've been part of over the years. So to me, that was an amazing experience to actually have people all be in the same room. Um, and at the first one in February, we started a kind of a timeline about people's energy fights and struggles, primarily U.S. centric. And um, it was really interesting, and, and it also helped helped us remember how much we don't remember, uh, how much how many fights there've been, how many struggles there've been, actually some really successful struggles, how long this has been going on, and uh, and what are the connections between these often the same companies. So so that was really people really found that really helpful and. I was hoping to bring all that here, but it's kind of overwhelming. So we're just going to start with simple. Um, so first, I just wanted to uh, quickly, I work at Highlander, and we usually sit in a circle and everybody talks, so this is kind of weird to me to be up here. So oh, I understand. <laughs> so um, we're, we're going to participate. So first, I just thought if people could say their names and where you're from quickly so we can kind of know who's in the room. So I'm here, and I'm Susan. I grew up in Oak Ridge. I live in Knoxville. I'm Tabitha. I'm from Southern Illinois. I'm Lauren. I'm from Nashville, and I live in Cookville. If you want to say if you're part of an organization, oh yeah, I'm Green Collar, John Sheriff Sockham. Mary Hendrick, uh, Rural County Now Union from Oak Ridge, Sockham, TCW, PCR Club, League of Women Voters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Eric from Grand Union, Tennessee, for Common Justice. I'm Ellen. I live in Oxford, Mississippi. Um, students for Green. I'm Kristen. I'm from Clarksville. I'm from Minnesota. I'm uh, I'm Steve Payne. I'm a recent transplant to Memphis from Minneapolis. Uh, I'm uh, Jackie Posey, and uh, I'm a retired uh, elementary school teacher. I live in Cam Creek, Alabama, right outside the 10 mile radius of Browns Ferry Nuclear Power Plant. My name is Phil. I'm from Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I'm with a small group of putting together there called Stop Fracking Around Chattanooga. I'm Tara Curry. I'm from Hyman, Kentucky, but I live in Portland, Oregon, and I'm with the Center for Biological Diversity. Hello, my name is Brandon. I'm from Murfreesboro, and I'm a student from Hyman, Michigan. My name is Megan. Speak up! My name is Megan. I'm also from Murfreesboro, uh, and MTSU students from Environmental Action. My name is Nathan. I'm originally from Nashville. I'm living in Johnson City, Tennessee. I'm with uh, the Environmental Conservation Organization at uh, East Tennessee State University. Uh, my name is Taylor. I'm originally from Nashville, and I live in Johnson City, and I'm with the Environmental Conservation Organization at ETSU. I'm Margo, and I'm with the Alabama Sierra Club, and I live in Birmingham, Alabama. Well, uh, patients with Alabama Sierra. I'm Grace. I'm originally from Nashville, but I live in Knoxville, and I am with United Mountain Fence and the appeal organizer. I'm Elizabeth. I'm from, uh, I live on the farm. I'm with uh, uh, Frack Free Tennessee, uh, Peace Roots Alliance, Code Pink, and uh, American Forum, among I'm other things. <laughs> I'm Ken Edwards from Jonesboro, Tennessee. Uh, I'm with the Appalachian Peace Education Center out of uh, Abingdon, Virginia. I've been a long time peace and justice advocate with the Church of Christ. Uh, Ray Bellamy from Tallahassee, Florida, uh, with uh, positions of social responsibility. Hi. I'm Charles White. Uh, I live in West Tennessee, and I'm with Mountain Justice and Tennessee Chapter of the Sierra Club. Thank you all for being here at Civil Center. Everyone introduced? Do you want to introduce yourself? I'm Sinclair from MTSU with the Students for Environmental Action. Okay. So um, I thought we could spend the rest of this time creating a timeline. And this is really a way to gather both the stories from that we know about, things we've heard about, and things people have been part of. So we're going to start with some cards I put together. And we'll, I was going to pass it on to people and have people kind of present them to the group and we'll put them in time timeline order. And then we're going to have you all add things, add pieces of paper. 
um, and we'll kind of do this chronologically, and then we're going to look at the, the timeline kind of all together and say what does it tell us and what are the things do we see that need to be there. Is that right? Okay, so who's willing to uh, share one of these that I have created? Okay. So if you just take a look at it, and you can say a little more about it if you'd like to. This is actually all 1900s, um, but we can go back into the 1800s once you all get going. Century to, to gain, you know, really pivotal moments of labor rights in this country, um, and this this march on Blair Mountain and kind of the, the struggles of the, the coal miners against the, the bosses and the thugs, um, and all of the energy that came from that really led to the unionization and the union movement. Um, you know, we got the eight-hour workday out of that. We got minimum wage out of that. Um, you know, what led to workers uh, for when you get hurt, whatever that's called. I can't remember um, that and. Yeah. Can you talk a little longer? Everybody talk a little more. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, well, we have this OSHA now. They had MSHA in the mining industry before that, the Mining Safety and Health Administration, and a lot of the miners, or the organizers from the mining unions were not organized unions in other industries. Yeah, absolutely. Mine safety this, still being an issue, as you know. Yeah. A promiscuous woman I knew dated the man who developed strip mining. He developed strip mining because uh, of the deaths in the deep pit mines, what we see as the environmental consequences were the unintended consequences of a shift to strip mining. The death rate and disability rate did plummet with that switch. 
All right, so let's see. Is there something coming shortly after 1920? I forgot the dates of what I was doing here. Let's see. After 1930s, 1940s, 1950s. Oops, I skipped several decades. Okay, y'all fill in. Okay, 19. I don't. I don't have 1950s on here, but I remember the 1950s when they showed mechanization of these giant um, diesel and steam-powered shovels. For one man in a shovel this big was just a dot almost, and. Uh, and this has continued a tremendous mechanization, particularly in the uh, Canadian tar sands excavation, as well as strip mines for coal and others. I live about four miles from uh, what I always considered a bottomless pit, where uh, zinc and iron was mined in Bumpus Cove between Jonesboro oh, yeah. and Irwin. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so this is a picture, this is a great picture by Gene Rasmussen of with a giant shovel. <laughs> So again, that was also led to fewer jobs. So part of the struggle in Appalachia is because of the slowly de declining job base in the mining industry. So people desperate for jobs in the communities and other industries. All right. Okay. 40s, 50s, 60s. <coughs> uh, a bunch of strip mining trucks. Uh, uh, well, trucks filled with coal. But uh, those were 60s, 70s. Uh, I was in Lexington, Kentucky, uh, treating some coal miners about that time. And, uh, and it was uh, quite an emotional experience. Uh, these people would come in uh, with the limbs cut off or whatever uh, in the middle of the night, sub freezing weather. And uh, in some cases, I was convinced that they were cutting their own digits off uh, to get out of the whole system. Uh, and I had no reason to doubt that I would have done the same under those conditions. Uh, Sub-freezing weather covered with, uh, they were black. Uh, it would take months to get rid of the blackness off their skin. And uh, uh, they were on the mid or 1 a.m. to 8 a.m. shift or whatever. and. Uh, I saw two individuals exactly matching that pattern who cut off the tips of their fingers at that hour from the same mine on consecutive nights on call. Wow. You know, just, I mean, anyway. So this picture actually is, um, so people started transitioning from, strip, from deep mining to strip mining in Appalachia. It was unregulated. And so this is actually a picture of women stopping coal trucks in what was a banning strip mining movement. So all across Appalachia and actually across the country, people were really trying to stop the practice of, of strip mining. Um, Sokka was part of that. Kentuckians for the Commonwealth actually came after that. But there's a long history of fighting the, the devastation of both for workers and for the environment in mining. And it continues today, as we know. So is, that, is there another strip mining one? I think there's a, there we go. Crunched my fingers. Oh. <laughs> this is uh, strip mining damage and also uh, uh, unregulated uh, cutting of the forest, causing a uh, hundred year uh, floods <clears throat> several <coughs> times in a row within you know years of each other. I had a friend that lost her home twice mm -hmm. in hundred year floods and uh, eventually has moved out of the Appalachian area because there's, she had no home, and and uh, she moved to Colorado. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I don't know. I think she's passed on. It was it was devastating for her. The the uh, whole thing about the strip mining, just throwing whole mountain tops into the valleys and and uh, poisoning all the streams and the waters, destroying whole communities. Uh, and it still continues. That's happening yet. So it's, uh, it's a bad deal. And, and we have to stop it. And oh, there, in, you know, a lot of that is when they put the uh, uh, coal ash waste in the uh, uh, big waste ponds in Kentucky. I believe it was about 15 years ago. They had a huge uh, uh, disaster with that and destroyed 
thousands and thousands of acres of, of land, so buried houses, and, and it still hasn't been cleaned up, but of course we don't care about that. And then of course we had the, uh, the uh, spill in Tennessee, Kingston. just uh, the Kingston spill, and uh, that hasn't been cleaned up and probably never will either. So one important thing about the, the banning strip mining movement, it led to the passage of the federal strip mine, SMAC, what they call it, 1976 Surface Mine and Control Reclamation Act. Um, at that point, mountaintop removal was severely limited in the regulations, but in the 90s, under Bush, the regulations were opened that back up, and that's when the, the move to really devastate the mountains even more with mountaintop removal happened. So there was a change in the regulations that actually opened that up. Uh, uh, Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act it was passed in 1976. It was like instead of banning it, they decided yep. to try to regulate it. Yeah, and it was a national fight. It was people groups from all over the country fighting for control of strip mining. Yeah, and the uh, the environmental groups, the grassroots groups, wanted a complete ban of strip mining. Um, and at the time, it was some of the bigger environmental groups. Uh, I'm not going to name names because I may get them wrong. That that went to the table with their lawyers and compromised a deal for regulation, and that's not what the movement wanted. Um, and so this is something I think we need to be wary of as a, as a movement moving forward about who we, we give the power to to go and make these decisions for us and whether they're, they're in it for you know what the people really want or if they're going to compromise for something that, that really just made it worse. I really think no compromise at, at these levels. If we want to have a world to live in, we've got to go with no compromise. It's really important. All right, let's see. Uh, Kevin, if you want to go ahead and share the one you've got, because it's kind of related to this. Yeah. Um, 1970 to 1980, the Appalachian anti-strip mining movement, songs and music to tell stories and inspire. Well, um, I find this really interesting that I would get this one, because um, one of my mentors has become Jeff Biggers. And Jeff is a real storyteller. And we're finding that in order to create the connection with other people who have never really heard about what our campaign is, which is fracking, that we tell personal stories. We tell personal stories, or I tell a story for, from a victim who I've talked to. And that's how we start to create the connections. And we start to create the connections with the, the poetry and with the songs and with the stories. And so now we've got bands that are creating music. So I think this is a really important part of organizing because if you can't make the connection with the people on the other side of the table, then you really are talking to a wall. Where's the date on that one? 70s and 80s, I mean, there was a whole, the Highlander, they had they had workshops to encourage musicians and artists to be part of movements and right. to help bring that into the people's movements. So this is a picture of the Real World String Band. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Oh, From yeah, Kentucky, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. actually when they, this is when they first formed. Uh -huh. um, it's a women's bluegrass band. They're really great. Still around? Oh, yeah. Right. They yeah, are. Uh, music has been a really big part of the, the anti strip mining uh -huh. labor movements. And, uh, for a long time, uh, Sarah and Benning, I think, was maybe doing stuff as early as the 20s. I'm not sure if it's that early, but she was like an amazing ballad singer and songwriter. And has this great song called The Amy Capital System. And she was from the Kentucky Mining. Louder. Uh, Sarah Ogan Gunning uh, was this great songwriter from the anti strip mining movement from Eastern Kentucky with an amazing song called I Hate the Capitalist System. Um, <laughs> and I think she might have been recording as early as the 20s or 30s. And she was related to Florence Reese, who wrote Which Side Are You On when they were hiding yeah. in the house so that they were after her husband. <laughs> yeah, sang that up Sang it in Wisconsin. Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let's see. I think that's all we have for strip mining. We have some nuclear. I do. Um, okay. I've got the anti-nuke movement 1970s to today. Um, I don't know a lot about the earlier years of that, so someone will have to fill in. But I do know that today there's been a lot of really cool victories, and you know the nuclear industry has been trying to have this renaissance, and they're not going to have a renaissance because it's time for them to go home and pack it up and you know stop boiling water in this really dangerous way. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, really cool, the, the, what's listed on here is the Vermont Yankee nuclear plant, um, which is up in Vermont, obviously, and it's scheduled to close um, in 2014 and be completely decommissioned. Um, there was also a recent victory in Florida. Um, did folks remember what that place is called? Something? Yeah, at that place. Um, 
And uh, so that, that one was stopped from being built at all. Um, and there's been a couple other ones. Uh, I think Calvert Cliffs in Maryland has been a recent victory. Are they planning to decommission to folks now? You don't know? I don't know. I, there's something going on good there, so we'll have to look into that some more. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, there are folks organizing in, down in Georgia against Plant Bogle, and, uh, and that's ongoing. And, and uh, we've had, you know, some successes recently with some reports on Browns Ferry, and, and, you know, people are just holding these nuclear industries to, to task because they have to follow all these regulations, and they're not following them, and they don't have comprehensive, like, emergency management plans, and they don't have, you know, the, the best storage systems, and so there's a lot of pressure going on along those lines, and it's really, really inspiring. Um, that's all I have to say about it. One thing about the Crystal River, if I could point out, too, is they're looking at the possibility of using that as a natural gas storage system. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that might be fair watching. It might be tell some and the purpose of the encampment was to stop the scheduled deployment of Cruise and Pershing II missiles before their suspected shipment. Um, and, and the encampment went on for five years. Let, let me add to that, uh, this Physicians for Social Responsibility group, uh, of which I'm a member, uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace uh, some years ago for their nuclear disarmament actions. And they were, uh, they were, I, I connect Helen Caldicott, a mm -hmm. Harvard pediatrician with that movement. Right. She was yep. a, she came Is she wrote the <coughs> A firebrand. She still is. Yeah. She still and, is. <laughs> she Listen is. to Helen. She, She's telling it. She has been uh, kind of marginalized by the leadership for some reason. Because she's a woman. Uh, but, well, <laughs> yeah. And, and, it's, uh, and it's wrong uh, because she has been the heart and soul of that organization. Absolutely. And. Uh, and there's now a motion by our Florida uh, president, Lynn Ringenberg, a uh, pediatrician from Tampa, to the national to award her the status that she's been oh, absolutely. deserving all this time. She was not allowed to attend the Nobel Prize thing because she was a woman. So she's a woman. Explaining why they would have a women's camp instead of <laughs> yeah. No, no, I, I was touched yeah. by that. Yeah, and there's a lot, I mean, the nuclear movement, I, I actually, I started thinking about it last weekend, I thought, it started with the atomic bomb, it's been long, it's been wide, it's been deep, and there's been hundreds and thousands of millions of people all along the trajectory of this movement. Yeah, I was thinking about that, like, uh, back in the 70s, the, back in the 70s, the industry wanted to drill over a thousand reactors in the country, and we got a little over a hundred years. Well, largely because the citizens were so strong back in the day.
Yeah, earlier this year we had somebody from uh, Eastern Navajo Diné against uranium mining come and speak at one of our Mountain Justice camps, and there's a lot of uranium mining that's gone on on indigenous land in this country. Yeah. They're also fracking for for uranium up in the Black Hills, and the the water, the aquifers are being affected, and and Native Americans are dying of of liver and uh, thyroid cancers. Yeah, so really, it's, and apparently they're wanting to do more uranium mining up there too. They've done uranium mining in that area yeah. as well. And a lot of people don't think of the nuclear industry as an extractive industry, but it is. There's a proposal in Virginia for a new uranium mining. Yeah. Pending, yeah. Mm -hmm. New nukes are dirty from beginning to end. So some like of the dirty by coal. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's we know, the trouble, right? <laughs> do we have anything here about the uh, Y twelve three? You can do this after we we're going to finish oh, these and then okay. we're going to do the round. Okay. So let's see. We got who else has one? You have one and you have one. Okay. Why don't you go ahead? This is this is a very important one uh, involving the Kentuckians for the Commonwealth. I'll just read it. In nineteen eighty eight. Uh, Working with many people across the state, they were successful in getting a constitutional amendment in Kentucky to outlaw broad form deeds. Broad form deeds separated the minerals from the surface with the advent of strip mining. Mineral owners were mining and destroying the surface land held by others. Uh, this is something that's going to play into the fracking <clears throat> because there are, there are parts of the country in Texas and Pennsylvania where people are not being allowed to refinance their homes or go to purchase a home because they can't, because they don't own the mineral rights. The mineral rights have been purchased just for a paltry sum by, you know, some of the mining companies. And this is something, I feel, personally, I feel like it might be one of the ways to fight mm -hmm. fracking, is, is to let people know that they don't, all they own is just the dirt on top of the land that they it, it sits on. And I feel like this might be an inroad for some of us going forward uh, to fight fracking locally. And if I could, I'd like to ask this young lady to say something else about it. When she saw this, she said, well, my great uncle was in on that campaign. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, fine. I, so I grew up in Knox County, and my great uncle, Bay County, was in Floyd County. And I kind of cut my environmental teeth. I grew up between two mines, and I felt totally powerless, and everybody did it. My great uncle would come over on Sunday and slim his fist on the table and talk about the broad form deed. And uh, when they won, and I just found this a couple months ago, I was digging out on YouTube, and KFTC put this video online, and my great uncle was there. And he said, we took our case to the people. We took it to the state. We went all over the state with the other side had the money, but we had the elbow grease. And That's it, right. It, yeah, really, it, yeah, it was amazing. It was, it was amazing. amazing. They, yeah. they changed, got people to vote to change the Constitution of Kentucky, of Kentucky, in Kentucky. which was incredible. Yeah. It was an amazing campaign. Yeah. And, and there is there's, there's also like a surface rights law in Tennessee relating to oil and gas that Sock and worked on some. So I think the issue of surface rights and mineral rights is a way that people have over different. Uh, energy sources work too. In Tennessee, a lot of strip mining has gone on on wildlife management areas where the state owns the land, but corporations own the mineral rights and are mining it. Up uh, in Knoxville, the uh, Sunquist Wildlife Management Area, I think, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Let's see, we got one more? Um, this is that when that people of color mess together for the principles of environmental justice, and they put together a list of about 17 different principles that took into account economic alternatives, account race, and justice in general. And I went to the People's Conference on Climate Change and the Rights of Mother Earth in Bolivia. I think it was kind of a take on this original conference, but to have countries who are usually disenfranchised and don't have a say to try to continue these, these different um, um, <coughs> principles of environmental justice. So the term environmental justice, do people heard that term before? Yeah. It really is to, to recognize who is most directly affected by these. It's often people of color, it's often poor white communities, and that there's a disproportional impact in terms of the cost of environmental issues. Okay, now it's your turn. Okay. There's a really great website resource uh, for environmental justice. What is it like? Uh, Peter Robert Bullard, she's all the ones that we can link. That one. It's like EJNet. Mike Ewald, Mike Ewald, it's ejnet.net or something. Everybody take one of these. You can find it if you look at Environmental Justice, and exactly the link. Okay, so now we want you all to add to the timeline. It can be something you've been part of. It's been something you know from your history. It can be something you know from your community. It can be something that you saw in a movie. Welcome to put whatever you want. <laughs> if you want to draw a little picture, that 
would make the timeline more beautiful. <laughs> and if anybody needs a marker, I've got some. They've begun some uh, strip mining on Blair Mountain as of now, uh, but they don't they don't have complete access. Well, they have access to rice at all, but there's still ongoing fights. People trying to get back on the National Historic Registry because it was on the National Historic Registry, and then it was taken off because they wanted to coal mine it. And uh, so that's a big coup. But that's still going on, and you guys can look into that and, and give them support. They've got a community center down there, and we're going to go hard to protect that that site, uh, which should be on the National Historic Registry. So, is there anybody else? 1800s, early 1900s. against the Spanish Empire. Um, it was the mine workers in South Africa that helped lead the movement against apartheid. So all over the world, mine workers, unions, and mine workers have led resist, uh, have been leaders in all the different movements that we're all part of. 1600s to today, covering the most Protestant area. <laughs> okay, any other early ones? 1910? 1920? 1930? 
<laughs> I mean, we usually know the things that we're part of. That's why you can see this little yeah. block. That's the things I know about, so that's fine. Well, when uh, the Tennessee uh, um, Y-12 was built, it was in the 30s, because that's where part of the atomic bomb went. 40s, during the war. Yeah, early, late 30s, early 40s was when that was put in, and then that was the uh, one of the components for the bomb that went off in uh, Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki. And uh, so that was the only time that nukes have been used against civilians, and it was the United States that did it, but we were so paranoid that somebody else might do it. Mm -hmm. Is that what yours is? Yours that show? Uh, that, actually, I have a whole <laughs> bunch of things about that because uh, they're, uh, they've uh, developed a. Uh, of course, now they're developing new weapons at Y-12, and that's of course against all the treaties that we've signed. And they want to spend eighty billion dollars building a whole new thing there. The whole thing. Uh, there's a uh, organization you might have heard of, Aripa, out of Oakland. Actually, out of Oak Ridge, Oak Ridge environmental I mean, Oak Ridge. out of Knoxville. Out of Knoxville, right? And uh, uh, Ralph Hutchinson has written many papers about the complete stupidity of the siting of this place. It's really impossible to really be secure. The design is faulty for the whole thing. The the whole thing is just a boondoggle that is a bad, bad move everywhere. And three people broke in to uh, Y-12 uh, nun and two uh, activists, and they've been convicted of all kinds of things, which might, you know, will probably be a life sentence for the nun. She's rather old. <coughs> and the hearing was going to be this month on the 30th, but they changed the date again to January. So it really behooves us not to forget, not to forget, and to and to stay aware of that because we really want people to be writing and being there as they can during the hearings to make sure that these people are given medals instead of. And there's lots of actions yeah. about this bomb plant that Reba does, so it's a good, uh -huh, good thing right. to know about. Uh, uh, we tried for a long time to do things in August at the. Uh, uh, anniversary of, of the uh, attack on, on, in Japan and the killing of so many people at one. And uh, it's very hot. So if you, in your own communities, can have memorances, August the 6th or the first time of Hiroshima, that would be good for them. Yeah, I just want to add something. I would say personally that Hiroshima, Hiroshima was the I would say Hiroshima and Nagasaki were the only time news for use against civilians. It was the only time directly uh, uh, used yeah. to the oh, yeah. population, but uh, on Pacific Islands, and uh, especially the Kiki Atoll, they did a lot of nuclear testing that was really devastating to help the indigenous people there, yeah. um, including like detonating bombs off like on the shores and injecting people with nuclear waste to see how it impacts people's health, like with them not knowing what they were being injected with and having them In the 1970s, we had a Y-12 conversion project that somehow or another didn't get exactly off the ground, but yet it strengthened a lot of protesters, particularly in the Jefferson County area, uh -huh. as well as uh, here in Knoxville and Oak Ridge, and I was uh, really glad to be part of that. Uh, we attempted some long-term goals, and they sort of got stymied because of management and contract changes, Y-12, among other things. So, so tell me what Y-12 refers to. It's the nuclear plant there in Oak Ridge. It's, like it's where they, they, they uh, it's a bomb component, the component plant. That's where it's called the nuclear plant. It's not an acronym or anything. It's right. And it's, they're, they're proposing a whole new facility uh, to actually 
need to cool. concentrate the different uh, different facilities that are located around the country. So one irony is that these workers in Oak Ridge have to go forward and say, we really want this. Is so the Bridge National Lab the same? Oak Ridge, it's a different, that's X10. Okay. K25 is where they enrich uranium. Thank you, I grew up in Oak Ridge. <laughs> 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 so there are three facilities, X10, Y12, and K25, when they build Bridge National Lab. Glad I could show my, we just know our and you said, where your parents were, S10, Y12, Y25. <laughs> okay, uh, other contributions? Did you in the 70s? I think we're kind of in the 60s, 70s, yeah. I gathered you wanted us to be optimistic, and um, <laughs> so I put down the broad thing of Earth Day in the 70s. For those of you who are old enough, how many participated in the first Earth Day in some way? 10% of the American population participated maybe just in gathering their batteries and not throwing them into their trash or sorting their aluminum cans, 10%. And out of that came the Environmental Protection Agency, the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, so many things. And so currently the closest thing I've seen has been the Occupy movement, and the uh, Organizing for America segue from Obama's for America with their action days. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. All right, thank you. All right. Different now, but yeah, quite 
they, they see so on that. Yes, we are. No, we won't. Yes, we yeah, are. Right. <laughs> if, if they they so they do it. It became so expensive. They were just like, So, uh, who else? 70s, 80s? I got 80s. plant in Telford, Tennessee. Uh, they were promptly fired, the workers were. However, we're still ongoing with protests by uh, CPT, Christian Peacemaker Teams out of Chicago, as well as the Appalachian Peace Education Center, Avenue, Virginia. Where was that? It's in Telford, Tennessee, near Jonesboro. Okay. All right, next. Four miles up went to my house. <laughs> Are we, are we into the 2000, 90s? 2020, 2020s? Okay, 90s. Okay, uh, Actually, the anti-logging movement in Cascadia, the northwest part of the U.S., and it actually started before that. I think it started in the 80s, but got really big in the 90s with a lot of tree slits, tree spiking, blockades, and tactics they used to stop the trees from being cut down. And they set up like a big village in the redwood forest to stop them from logging? Uh, I think they probably set up several. There's a great movie about it called Big Eyes. Great documentary. Really inspiring. Other 90s? 2000? We go 90s? Yeah, I won't have to present, I guess. Okay. Um, Struggle for green jobs. Like, I'll lure a coal and nuclear plant that they've done the technology in these plants is inefficient compared to uh, recent developments and energy efficiency. Power utilities can to favor these at taxpayer expense and the billions of funds in the budget over customer subsidized renewables such as wind, solar, and wave and tidal power and integrated electric charging for hybrid and electric vehicles. <coughs> Professionals in these businesses with green jobs or in research for green jobs continue to struggle with their role to advocate for tax subsidies and fair policy. Some of you can help me. When was the coal ash spill in Tennessee? 2008. 2008. 2008. 2008. 23rd, 22nd. 22nd, 2008, yeah. Okay. Is that we'll have 2008 <laughs> through the present. Because uh, the hazardous, hazardous waste that is being cleaned up from that site is now being moved into low income communities in West Alabama. Right. Uh, there has been protest <coughs> regarding that to try to stop it, but unfortunately, county officials are in support of it because it brings in money to the community. Mo money and death. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which is the same place there was a whole toxic waste dump, right? Yeah. 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 Ye
you just said, a lot of what we have to do is wordsmith well, and I heard a very powerful comment from Park uh, Overall of the Northeast Tennessee, is any job worth the slow death of your children? That's right. Mm -hmm. And she works directly with the one that I'm going to mention here since the 19, really late 50s into the 60s, nuclear fuels opened in Irwin, Tennessee to reprocess or so process fuel for the a nuclear submarine fleet. And it is upstream about 12 miles from where I live, dumping whatever waste they have into the Nolichucky River with unaccountable uh, lost waste or, or materials that unaccounted for that they don't know where they got to, and on and on and on. And there is a currently an ongoing public citizens uh, class action suit against them that keeps getting reset and reset and reset in the local uh, federal courts. People go rafting down that river. Like yeah. I've been down there right. many times. Yeah. After I found that out, I've kind of been scared. Is this where so. they made uranium bullets? No, 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 no. no, no. no. It's no. arrogant. No. 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 One on each side of the river. It's a lovely place. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I okay. did a poster on that once. <laughs> <laughs> that I, didn't, I did two thousand and ten the first annual Appalachian Public Interest Environmental Law Conference. Held here in Knoxville, bringing people together. <laughs> 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 they are excellent. Yeah. You, you get lawyers from across the country who come for their continuing education credits in environmental law to this absolutely fantastic, inexpensive. Your head will explode. Amount of information you will get. And scientists and engineers, not just lawyers, so it's everyone. That what is the date this year? October 11th through the 13th. What's the name of this group? It's the Appalachian Public Interest Environmental Law Conference. So if you just look at appeal.org, A-P-I-E-L.org. But I'm sure after this conference, y'all will send out something to everyone about appeal. So you'll you'll have it in the final day on public safety. Where did you go to cheat? You should have already known about it's it. Right? it. It's it's it. it. Is it in Knoxville? It's right It's going to be in Knoxville, the law school across the street. So it's really, really near. Okay, here we go. I put uh, on March 11, 2011, a combination of tsunami and earthquake caused the meltdown of Fukushima, uh, which is right now our biggest known uh, nuclear disaster. Um, it's 30% more radiation than Chernobyl, and that's estimated. And the reason I put it is because it's currently now, because of ocean current patterns moving its way up, um, uh, up towards Alaska and then down the coast of California and that will be pretty bad. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's continuing to happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, other people? Let me just Yeah, get that's it. fine. Mm -hmm. I have one for, for yesterday. Okay, all right. <laughs> right. Tina, I have a group, a bunch of environmental groups who've been working on the UT fracking proposal. And while we didn't necessarily, it wasn't necessarily us who stopped it because they got their bids, as of yesterday, they put it on hold and they took it, as of yesterday afternoon, they took it off of the board's agenda. For Yay. October, so the, the proposal was to frack on your campus. On UT yeah. public lands, not on our campus, okay. but on publicly owned lands, okay. and they were yeah. gonna do. It was for research, but it, we like had internal documents for FOIA, and it was not for research. It's not really public lands; it's state-owned lands. Yeah. yeah. Leased out to this is this is a land grant. Uh, <laughs> we can, yeah, we have a session about that coming up next in after twenty-five. Okay. Actually. All right. Let's see. What's we got? In spring of 2012, a couple women got together in Southern Illinois and they joined as a small group and they decided to create a grassroots organization aimed at educating local citizens about the harms and risk of uh, the fracking industry to communities, the environment, and future generations. But they also wanted to educate the local people about their right to a healthy environment and to reestablish real democracy through true voices of the local people. So they created SAFE, which I'm a part of, Southern Illinoisans Against Fracturing Our Environment. And uh, little did we know what can of worms we were really getting into at the time. We thought we were just dealing with fracking, but it opened up into pipelines and transportation issues and frac sand mining 15 miles from my house. So, um, you know, we've really had our eyes opened wide about the social injustice and um, you know, we're seeing how the abuse of the land is tied to the abuse of the people. Mm -hmm. um, I'll talk about the, uh, the 
more recent movement against mountaintop removal mining or the rape of our Appalachian Mountains, as I like to say. Um, it really jumped off in, uh, in West Virginia. Um, and man, like, poor West Virginia is getting devastated by, by this mining. Um, but what, what really inspired kind of the, the more recent, like, refreshing of the anti strip mining movement um, was a, a boulder had fallen off a site and it rolled through these people's homes and killed their, their young child um, went during, during the sleep. And, you know, there was a lot of public outcry and a lot of people came together. And what ended up synthesizing from that was a, a regional coalition called Mountain Justice um, with activists from Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, and Kentucky all having kind of their own on the ground organizing bases within each state. Um, and there have been, it's, it's been always been action focused. There's been camps that have happened most every year, Mountain Justice summer camps, spring breaks, fall breaks. This guy is running all over the, the eastern seaboard, telling everybody about it. Other people are doing the same. And, and you know, one of the main goals was to make it a nationally known issue, which it now is. So that's been very successful. Um, there have been, you know, there's been a lot of victories here and there with, with certain things stopped and, you know, permits denied and postponed and all sorts of things like that. But what I want to talk about, um, because it was what brought me into the movement and really inspired me, was um, a tree sit that happened in West Virginia in January of 2010. Um, and a couple of activists of Mountain Justice and Climbing Ground Zero uh, set up, you know, these platforms and these trees right off the side of, a, of an active mountaintop removal site. And because they set that up, the companies had to halt all of their work, um, and they were able to hold off blasting for nine entire days. Um, it's January, y'all, in West Virginia, so it's freezing cold. They were bombarded by just these bright lights and sirens and sounds all night. And this dude was there; he could tell you all about it. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that was the second of what has now been three tree seats sits in West Virginia. Uh, the first happened in a couple years, a year before that, and lasted how long? Like first, yeah. Seven days. Seven days for the first one. That one was nine. Then we, we had an unprecedented 30-day tree sit that happened last year. And I'm not sure what are, what's in the works right now, but there's lots of good stuff going on. And uh, there have been roads blockaded. We've had people blocking on, sitting on coal barges, locking down to Department of Environment, you know, doors and on and on and on. So, um, you know, when when the people in power will not listen, a lot of times you have to step up and take direct action and, and get yourself in a position to say, you know what, I, I may be doing something illegal by law, but I'm protecting a natural law, and that's more important. So that's that's why I wanted to bring that up because I think it's really important. Yeah. Um, I'll start. radiation visible. They're doing monitoring and really showing up where the radiation is going and it can be made visible and they uh, that's going to be the major uh, thing that they're going to be pushing is to make radiation visible and to give warnings when the radiation uh, exceeds certain levels. Um, but that's something that is uh, going to be worked hard, hard here. What's the name of the organization? Best slash matter. Anybody else want to know one they want to share? One small one, if I could, and it was in 2000. It was this year. Uh, in Chattanooga, there was a developer that wanted to take out just a pristine hillside that oh, that set over the aquifers uh, that supplied the water to Hickson Utility District. Uh, we have, the, in, in that particular district, one of the cleanest water systems in the nation. And it was also going to cause a runoff into North Chickamauga <coughs> Creek. Uh, with They were going to develop a shopping mall and an apartment complex. And the wastewater running off over the asphalt was going to, in a regular rain, was going to create a million gallon an hour runoff into this creek. It was going to create flooding. And uh, the North Chickamauga Creek Conservancy, <coughs> along with just a lot of this grassroots organizers, we stopped it. We made enough noise with the city council that we stopped it. Uh, but what's happened since then is the Hitchin Chamber of Commerce has invaded the North Chick Creek Conservancy, fired Greg Vickery, who was the activist that actually got it going, and now they're, they installed their own little focus group that will make sure that the developer does it right, which is the way they were planning on doing it originally. So we're going to have it to fight again without our big help. Did you have one to share? Well, I uh, do actually. It's kind of recent, February 2013. Um, was the rally against the Keystone XL pipeline. 
and it was supposed to be the largest climate rally in US history. So um, that was kind of the So even though Obama was not in the White House at the moment, we were doing it. October 23rd is Fukushima is here. It's going to be national movement all around. There's uh, uh, actually uh, a lot of research and and uh, monitoring of the. Uh, of the uh, stuff coming in on the tides. And um, so uh, I know we have a, a, a nuke buster plant right on the farm in Summertown and to really be able to tell if the food is irradiated, it takes a lot of serious uh, action. So it's a very difficult and complicated thing to do, but we need to look into it. So just to say, I'm gonna leave this here, hoping people will add. Uh, to it, and if there's events that people are coming up, people should put them on here, and we can share it back out with people, I think. Um, I want, should we all just pause and say hello to the FBI and the NSA? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, I just want to say just a, a few words about well, Highlight. I hope they're paying attention. So, I appreciate you all adding to this. I mean, I was thinking about what do I know about the history? There's so much history, we don't have a way to remember it, we don't have a way to know it. So, I think it's really important in terms of, so you're all really great about seeing the connections between things. That's really important as we do our local fights to draw the larger picture and look for alternatives. Let me just say a quick thing about Highlander. So Highlander is a, started in 1932 in Monteagle, Tennessee. It was a workshop. It is was and is a workshop center. We do grassroots workshops with groups working on environment, economics, immigration, youth, civil education. rights. Civil. It was a big part of the civil rights movement. We've done a lot of labor workshops. Now we're in Jefferson County, which is about 20 miles from here, east. And um, I brought a, a, a little flyer for, a, a, we're having an annual event next week. Okay. And I can invite everyone to it. Grace Box, uh, oh, who's wow. an amazing 98-year-old woman from Detroit, uh -huh. um, is coming down to speak, wave. and she's going to be there with us. And then also, if anybody's interested in getting on, uh, uh, learning about how to, getting news from how to, just come down and sign this sheet, and I'm happy to add you all to our database. And I want to thank you all for coming to this and adding to the timeline, and I'm hoping that we can kind of get it together and share it back out so I think it was really interesting we need I asked if somebody I won't be there but if somebody could take it there that would be great wait I talked to um, Charles about taking it there okay and then getting it back because I, I started typing in stuff from the other things so I wanted to try to gather this up and then figure out a way to share it back out so, so people should keep at okay uh, and I'm happy to type up I'm happy to type up and get them back out Are you going to the church? Oh, yes, I am. Do you have a doctor? No. I was thinking of the